This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today, a repeat guest, a good friend, somebody who I talk to regularly, but I don't often put those conversations on the show. And I know he was comfortable with me sharing this conversation. So here it is. Today, my conversation is with Larry Height. Larry was originally profiled in the book, The Market Wizards by Jack Schwager. Larry also has a book called The Rule, came out a few years ago. He is a trend-following trader. He is a legendary trend-following trader. And I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Hello, Michael. Hey, Larry. How are you? Well, I'm sad and glad. I was going to write a book about losing. And the benefits of losing. I would make up funny names. The only actual people I know or know of was close enough to really know them who lost a lot of money. It was very interesting. I took everybody's story that I knew. You've read William O'Neill, right? I've not interviewed him, but I know of him, yes. You never will interview him. Oh, is he gone? Well, he's halfway gone. He's got dementia. Ah, okay. But anyway, O'Neill tells a story. There's this guy, Dreyfus. And Dreyfus had like a $15,000 stock fund. And every year, he was doubling the return of the whole industry. Right? If they made 30, he made 60. O'Neill lays out a chart of every one of those stocks. And these were his words. Every one of those stocks made a new all-time high. Not some, not a few, not mostly, but all of them. I have found that, and I've known this, but I don't know how, it's a very simple to make money in the stock, in any kind of market, provided you have the, in my case, the laziness to follow a system or, you know, somebody gets a lot. I went to everybody. They either got into a business where they were picking up pennies on railroad tracks. And the long-term capital management guys. Yeah, among others. There's this train coming. You jump in, you get the pennies. Now, I'm not saying that everybody dies when they do this. Pretty close to it. Those guys die. That's one thing. They were right a lot, but wrong for them, but also a lot. Their losses were few, but huge. They had so many winners that were looking great for so long. The strategy that they either developed or fell into, they just didn't contemplate that one big loss would just take out everything, take out all the work. Yeah, two Nobel Prizes winners. They were great. In the American bond market, they did. They were Southern brothers, and they invented American bonds. Mickey Marcus did it. Henry Kaufman did a huge history. Meriwether came in, and he ran on, and he ran that very well. But now they started to get, when they went to Russia, you guys would have killed them. They couldn't get out of that stuff. The Russians were not going to leave it. The Russians would do what any American bond trader would do. They will take you for every penny and not let you out till they drain you. As Solomon Brothers, Goldman Sachs, doing this, basically, there were those who had a lot of winners but very big losers. And I had made up good, funny names for people I knew and knew the stories. And then... There's the person who doesn't use stops. 
They're too smart to use stops, Larry. They don't have to. Yes. Yes. One of them told me that. <laughs> We're bring that experience to me. No. It's just like we are the market. Okay? So now I have these names of people that I actually know and was there. One guy I was renting office space for him. I watched him go broke. They had a guy working there, and the guy disappeared, being them with a big option position. What happened was, calls me in and he said, Larry, what would you do in this situation? I said, I believe the first loss is the best loss. He said, thank you, Larry. Turned out he was rewarded by not selling. And I walked into my friend Bob to me, so I said, we're not going to be renting here much longer. So the first guy. He got to a minefield. What he did was, he closed his eyes and walked. And he got to the other end and he got blown up. So now he thinks that go to a minefield, close your eyes. That's not going to last very long. I mean, I wasn't that old. It didn't seem to me a way that I would want to go through a minefield. What I found, then you got to our trading. The people that I see these, one is the people who are average now. Well, you know about Terrence O'Neill, right? I must have told you about that. He's an economist. They looked at 10,000 random accounts at a large, no commission brokerage place. And he found this an extraordinary thing. He wasn't an accountant, so it really bothered him. A lot of these people sell their winners to buy more than their losers. And more than it, like 60% of them. Well, I mean, we know that from commodity trading. So I thought, you see, I write a book. But then I said, really, have the book, it's the same shit all the time. I saw two guys the broker's office, and no one was going to come in with them. They did not take losses. And they were at a five-year run not taking losses. All their clients loved them. They looked good in the moment. <laughs> yeah, for years. I said, no, no, no. So I find the same thing that O'Neill finds. It's so simple. It's in my book. It's so simple. We've had all this crazy stuff happen out of the blue. Maybe it's not out of the blue, whatever. But Russia's here, Ukraine's here, and a lot of volatility, a lot of movement in the last couple months. And then if we look at the commodity markets, okay. We brought up when we were talking earlier about long-term capital management. That's a story that everyone knows now. But when we look at the current moment right now with all the market movements, the volatility, you just got to think that we've already probably had a few very large funds trading the way that you're talking about that's the bad way, you know, all these winners, I think maybe they've gotten better at hiding their blowups. They don't want to be known as these stories forever, but you got to think in the last couple months, there are some major funds that have just gone poof. Look, I'm having the last year, I made an enormous amount of money for me and without any particularly more risk. First of all, all the securities I had just went up anyway. So I don't have the funny. See, I thought you could do it all the time, funny stories, because I watched people do this. Like I had this one guy. I don't know why he started trading with a man, but he did. He made some money in sugar. Like maybe he made a million dollars, and he gave half of it back. And he decided he's going to get the money back from sugar. Why he decided that? Oh, well, he told me, should have owed him the money. And if you want to know if somebody's going to be a loser in the markets, when they tell you that the market owes them, you can go short that guy forever. About that example, the sugar example, this is also kind of the same with somebody who says they only trade one market. Because if they only trade one market, they're going to be in a constant state of trying to get revenge on that one market. Yeah, neither half of Prove that. He took on the Japanese government, and he lost. If you take on one market, and yeah, I have seen 
I forget what his name, but I did it in my big coffee train. I forget what his name is now. This guy was the greatest. If there's three top coffee traders in the world, he would be two. I was really into it. Driving home, Danny Rosenblum's limo. And Danny said to him, Gary McMahon, his name, said, do you have any regrets? The guy owns 3% of Goldman Sachs. He wonder what regrets he has. He said, yeah, I would be much richer if I had gone into oil because of being a market. I remember that very clearly. Because he knows how to operate. He really lives it night and day. I really couldn't go too much further. It's three things. It's exactly what I said in the rule. Your book, The Rule, just for people following along. Yeah, The Rule that David Ricardo wrote. Well, The Rule, you wrote a book, The Rule, too. Yeah, but it was based on his rule. That was how our conversation started. You were like, hey, I've lived this. I loved Ricardo's wisdom. And then you said, well, let's go ahead. And I remember the conversation. You're like, okay, the name of the book, The Rule. I will tell you, I am not an energetic. I mean, I'm not like the four people we used to be. I'm not frantic. But I've made a very good living. Now, not everybody can do this. I think they think too much of themselves. I was not a good athlete, not a good student, and I was distracted. I was not surprised that I could lose that something. I remember figuring out one night, you know, a deck of cards playing Vegas Solitaire, where you got 52, that if the deck you could lose, even though you go through the whole deck, even when you cheated, you could lose. And that, I said, okay, obviously part of this game is to keep your losses small, because you can't control them. You will lose. It's like an insurance company. You take too much concentrated risk, you'll get a fat premium, and then that place blows up a lot of your capital. Can I ask you a motivation question here? You're not 30 years old anymore. Look, you've got enough money. You can do what you want to do. But why are you motivated with the same mindset of a 30-year-old guy? Why not just kick back and... I don't know, sit out at the beach and drink those fruity drinks or something. Why are you motivated like you are? Well, first of all, it's the only thing that I've really done well. But it's fun to go in and make an algorithm, and the algorithm makes you money. By algorithm, you can mean a trend-following system, other types of systems, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, the trend-following system is really made. The trend-following system is the surest way to make money in stocks or anything else. I shared a story of yours recently with someone that was texting with me. They were all focused on entry. And I shared the story of you telling me about the random entry system that your firm made and that it did really well, maybe even better than the regular system, but you couldn't use it because then you would have to tell clients in the fund that you were using a random entry system that just would not compute. Maybe they would think you guys were crazy or not putting in the work or something. They would not understand. Well, the young man who did that to me, the first day he got there was Alex Raisman. We still go back to that. Was that the first time you had seen that with Alex, that you actually went through that exercise the first time in your career where you kind of like, wow, it even gave you a wow moment? No, no, here's the truth. Peter Matthews, who had a much better self-image, and I did. He said, but we're genius. Said, yeah, he did really great. I said, no. Nah. He said, Larry, what do you mean? I mean, we're one of the top fund managers. When I was there, we made about 30% of the year. Markets were good. I said, no. I can go in. Let's do it. I'll go in. Just that's it. Random generator picks where you go to trade. Then you flip another coin, and that flips long or short. Only thing is there's a 2% stop. That's it. Think about what you just said. That is so, there's a lot of complexity behind it. There's a lot of depth behind it, but you reduce it to a few sentences and it sums up the entire investing world in a few sentences. Not only does it sum it up in a few sentences, 
for the last 50 years, the last 100 years, the last 500 years, it sums it up for the next 500 years. It's this wonderful adaptive, it's a little algo. You've just spelled it out. It's amazing, that thinking that works. I think so. <laughs> Book about Tom. Basso. Yeah. Very nice guy. He had years of losing until I assume he learned to properly position himself. Yes, I'm very interested in that I found something like this. I understood this, A, from the world that I observed in Brooklyn. I mean, I once took a job. My little cousin was about one-third less than I was in weight. Got a job selling ice cream. So I said, come down. Larry was heavier. And then Larry goes out. And Larry doesn't like carrying ice cream. And it's hot. And my feet hurt. Bring the ice cream back, I said, I quit. But I had to wait for my cousin to go back with me. And I'm watching these kids who sell ice cream, who let's say came from age 14 to 22 or 23, play poker. So they caught. I look at them and I say to myself, hmm, there's 10 kids and everybody puts in a dollar. That's $10. So there's 10 to 1 if you win. You were doing the odds as a little kid. Yeah, in my mind, right? I mean, 10 to 1. And then there was going to twist it down, but this guy, this kid, he either cheated or whatever, but he managed to draw an inside straight. One in 52 chance. And he liked to call himself the bear. And he got up and he punched his chest. He said, the bear is lucky. And I looked up and I said, God, just keep him here. <laughs> Keep the lucky bear here. <laughs> and I would say something like, hey, that was a great thing. In my mind, it's this fucking schmuck. <laughs> you always win. Even when he didn't win. I said, hey, he believed. He really believed he was working. You were already using some psychological gamesmanship on him to keep his ego high. Yeah. It was the number. It, it was, he was enthralled with himself. It's one in 52 to make that flood. <laughs> one in 52, that is very hard to get. You have 51 against you. I'm a very bad student. You weren't really a bad student. You just didn't care about memorization games that they were teaching and boring classes and all that kind of stuff. You were always a smart guy. You just didn't care about the bullshit. No, i tell you how unsmart I was. They decided that maybe they would send me a, to a trade school. Maybe I'd be interviewing you today and you'd be like the master hammer maker or something. <laughs> so what happened was this guy, I'm 15 or 16, right? He gives me a test. Then he stops. He says, we're going to do this another way. I'm going to read you the question. And you have to select the answer. And of course, and he wrote a report. He said, Larry is extremely smart. And he has a high degree of mathematical intelligence. Nobody would have ever written anything like that about me. But he turned out to be exactly right. You ever watch The Evangelist? Well, you're from Virginia. You must have seen these evangelists. Yeah, there's a bunch of them. Ernest Angeli, Jim Baker, all these crazy guys. Yeah. I used to love them. And if I weren't Jewish, I would go into that business. What, to be one of them? Oh, you can make all this money. <laughs> so hold on. <laughs> so I'm imagining right now, I'm turning on the TV, and you are in a white suit touching people on the forehead and they're falling back on the stage and you're collecting the money at the same time. We should start that right now, Larry. I'll be the kind of younger minister. You'll be the older minister. They got to come in. You put their hand on their forehead. They fall back. I catch them. They give us a thousand bucks for each one of these. We'll make a lot of money. There's one guy, he's got a German or a Jewish name. He needed a $2 million plane. <laughs> Stuff of Jesus. 
Look, there's another guy. I can't remember his name. I used to watch him, Ken something, but he's worth like a half billion dollars. It's crazy. I will tell you something. It's a great thing. I used to watch these guys, and I never believed in God from a very early age. I can tell you exactly when I stopped believing in God. Very interesting. So I'm watching Victory at Sea. You don't remember this, you see. It was documentaries about the Second World War and the Victory at Sea, big documentary. There was one thing where it showed the Americans and the Germans both stopping for Christmas. Couldn't have been nine or ten. And I said to myself, wait a minute, this can't be. It can't be on both sides. Impossible. So then I go home, you know, I go to school the next day, and I have this, one of my buddies was Joe Steiner, and the other guy was Lenny Tarulli. They were my two buddies. And I told him I don't believe in God. Whereupon they both started to punch me. I was amazed that you can punch me, and you can make God happen. So you know what's interesting about your story, though, is that it's an interesting point. I've never heard someone say that. Okay, you got the so-called bad guys and the so-called good guys, and they're both communicating with the same God. You're a young guy, and you're looking at it and saying, well, hold on. Mathematically, logically, something's off here. You raise your hand and you say, excuse me, adults out there, can someone explain this to me? And the first thing everyone does, maybe using some of the young kids as henchmen to kind of beat you down until you just accept this, Larry. Don't ask any questions. <laughs> yeah. One of them became a mafia button man. I don't know what happened to the other guy. And they weren't hit in the I mean, They were like kids. But... The youthful would-be b- mafia button man <laughs> was practicing on you as a kid? <laughs> no, he grew up to be a... He was practicing on you when you were a kid? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was a friend of mine. I mean, I don't see him much, but I don't see him now at all. In fact, I have a very good friend. He was really heavily in the yeah, family like that. When he got out of jail, he said, yeah, come down. If you're going to be in Florida, I want to meet you. I'll meet you. I'll introduce you to my new friends. I said, Michael, I will meet you anywhere if it's just you and me. I'm not going to go to that lunch. Yeah, he and I have not spoken since. Because I figure, once again, these people are watched. Why do I want to be watched? You know what we got to do? I was thinking about this conversation today. We're not going to keep it in an hour. We're going to kind of keep it at this range right here. But what I'd like to do, and we should do this, you and I, because we talk regularly all the time, but we should do like a kind of just a half hour check-in update on some kind of issue or topic once a month. Why not? It's fun. Yeah. Of the people that I know, I can say you have the most knowledge on this industry. I know that somewhere, you wouldn't say where, you have your money working this way. You don't have to tell me who or what, but I know that. All I'll say is that when you're in this enough, your whole life becomes this way of thinking. You don't worry about trying things as long as they're calculated, taking certain risks. The whole thing of life, you could have very well likely have had the same strategies early in your life, and maybe you would have made 50% less money or 75% less money. That still would have been a huge amount of money. There's always a certain amount of, in reaching these astronomical heights, there's always a little bit, there's more than a little, there's always some luck involved. So it's like having the good strategy, having the good process, knowing how the world works and putting yourself in a position to be there, to get a big hit, a big home run. You even said this on this conversation, but that's what you're still motivated by. You're kind of like, well, why not? I'm still alive. Let me keep taking swings. Maybe I'll hit another home run. Why not? Well, I have this year. And I've also noticed if you have half a brain, volatility is your friend. Well, I've got a lot of volatility right now. And that's why I, in a year, just doing shit. What a fun, I have no longer remain. I'm just happy to be, I quit it. And I took a lot of my money out, but I kept some money in. You're making an enormous amount of money. So like last month, and what I still have there went up 30%. I have 
and you have a pound few. The people we see basically are all winners. Otherwise, you wouldn't interview them. In anything, you live in a world of people who are successful. And I'm not only talking about trading. You like stories like you love the donut guy and how he did it. He was great. You're talking about the Dunkin' Donuts guy. He was great, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Personally, that's the thing that I think makes America great. I will tell you, the older I get, my home, the less time or faith I have in my government. In reality, though, most of America's success really starts at the individual level. Yes, at certain points in history, at certain points in history, America galvanized to do certain things, build highways, get involved in some good wars, a lot of bad wars. Maybe there's no good wars. At the root level, it's the individual. You bring up the, quote, donut guy, uh, the Dunkin' Donuts guy, and it's like his father getting started, then the son taking it over and building it into a massive operation. That wasn't the government. That was just a father and a son and an idea, and they persevered. And that's just a great story. We don't hear enough of those stories. I tried to get the people at Aspen Institute. I was willing to back a seminar of 10 black businessmen who were not in the entertainment business or sports. And I knew that would be a great thing. To shake up people's understanding of what they think. Yeah. Yeah. For instance, all right, you know the rule, I know the rule. Now, I will tell you, and tell me if I'm wrong, you know all these people's records. You might not know them real well, but you know their records. You've been studying them for years. That rule, David Ricardo's rule, every one of them uses that rule. Would you say that's right or wrong? Yeah, of course. Let's say you're a brand new person. You don't know anything about investing. You kind of stumble into some trend following world and you're like, okay, well, this guy was in London and this guy was in New York and this guy was in Southern California and they don't know each other. And they're all, quote, trading and they're trend following traders. They've got this rule about taking a loss, you know, having a stop. It seems so simple. I think a lot of people just can't imagine that there's this consistency that these people that developed and existed independent of each other, which is, I find, one of the most amazing things is this real independence of each other. I mean, I've had a bunch of people on where I've really pressed them, well-known names, and I'll say, well, did you read about Don Chien or something? Well, not really. I kind of found out about that later. I was just doing my own thing. Fascinating that so many people, almost in this trading evolutionary process, end up coming to the same conclusion. What you keep saying, the rule, David Ricardo's rule, your book, the rule. It's amazing. But it sums it up in like a sentence. I think a lot of times inventions come at a certain time in history. The telephone, it's in the air. There's the means to do it. You said another thing. When you put your mind this way and you know exactly what you can lose, you don't really have to do much of this yet and what that loss would do to you. That's that thing. So you follow the trend. I found the guy who uh, basically creates advertising for lawyers to get money to fund these big cases. The great thing about this is cool. If you start a business doing that, it's an ordinary loss. And mostly you can make 10 to 15% a year, but you get an ordinary loss. So I'm just giving this guy 600 grand because I'm going to be in that business because I know I'm always going to have winners. Not every day you know, anything like that, but these losses, that means I get to carry forward and I come out with money at the end. If I come out with five or 10 and I deferred my taxes, for a year or five years, that's very really cool for me. I was thinking of moving to Puerto Rico. I don't think I'm going to do that because you can only be back in the States. We know a lot of people that have done that. I've only been there one time. I'm a pretty good judge of being at a place one time and saying to myself, 
yeah, I want to go back. My one time in Puerto Rico, and I was like, well, I don't want to go back. Yeah, well, that's why they get the tax. They have to have the tax money. Otherwise, who we want to go back to an island that has a hurricane every year? But it's very funny. Puerto Ricans have done extremely well in America. It's not knock, but it's just one of those things where people have to go experience a sort of Caribbean islands decide if it's for them. I'll save my uh, opinion about why I'm not a big fan. Hint, I don't like violence. There you go. By the way, if you find any contradictions to what I say, tell me. You tell me about a guy who liked to surf, made his system up, boom, and he had it run and he surfs. That story is coming. It's gonna be. It's gonna be. It's gonna be. It's gonna be in a book, and the podcast has already been recorded. Okay, can you tell me one thing? How long was this guy at it? I think I mentioned it before. I'm surprised he didn't go to a lot of the events and stuff like that. He started in the '70s. Yeah. Okay. So my question: You looked at his track record, right? Yeah. What was his average return? I don't recall off the top of my head, but his numbers looked like the numbers you would expect from a long-time trend-following trader going back to the 70s. Same kind of headspace as to so many of the names and across my books, your names, et cetera. So it's the same kind of stuff. His name was not a secret to me. I had known his name. I had seen it and all back, you know, the Stark Report and all that kind of stuff. It was all in there. I just didn't ever have a chance to connect with him. And how did you connect with him? I asked a friend who I thought would know him, and that friend knew him gave me an email address, and usually that's all I have to do interviews on this podcast is an email address. I mean, that's how I got Daniel Kahneman to appear. I just emailed him. No intermediary or anything, just Mike sending an email. And generally, if you send an email to an interesting person, an accomplished person, and I'm doing this podcast, I say, look, I'd like to have you on my podcast. I'd love to talk to you. Here's who I've had on prior. Most people say yes. I was going to put this down, but it's really true. I only have one podcast thing that I ever listened to. I never listened to Joe Rogan. I mean, I don't have the time. My single source of podcasting is you. Rogan's great, and a lot of podcasts are great. But here's, I think the difference, I didn't plan this, but I think the difference for what I do versus a Rogan or a Tim Ferriss, Rogan and Tim Ferriss will have on very interesting people that maybe they were in the sports world or some kind of UFC fighting or something like that. Or Tim might have some really different type guests on. But what I end up having is traders and academics that have really defined niche worlds. There's so much information you can find from traders and these academics that might have nothing to do with trading. But if I have somebody on who's dedicated their life to this like narrow subject area, whether people like academics or not, there's always useful information to come from those people. That's why this podcast probably appeals to someone like you, because ultimately you love to read books. You listen to my podcast, you might like an episode, you buy a book. There you go. Boom. Oh, yeah. They must love you. The publishers must love you. (laughs) I at least, at least it probably double by what's on that broadcast. For instance, you had this one about the companies that survive. I still have it. I mean, it shows you. And a lot of the companies that survived are extremely like turn following. I mean, I still have that Jeff Bezos stuff. I get pitched a lot of different guests, and I turn down a lot of guests these days because a lot of stuff, even if it's a name individual, I'll like look at the book. I'll look at the copy. It's just already been done. There's nothing novel there. There's nothing interesting. And I sometimes want to tell some of the publishers and some of the PR people and these authors, who's advising you? This topic's been done a million times. Why are you doing this? It's not even interesting. If the individual themselves is really interesting and they've done all kinds of stuff in their life and they happen to put out a book about motivation or whatever, okay, that's different. But so many people that don't appear to be known yet are just writing on the exact same topics. I don't understand it. I can't get interested. Well, it interests me because I like things that function well. I'm talking about the ones that I don't have on, the ones that I turn down. Tell me a rough... So that guy's been making more than 20% a year. I don't recall the numbers off the top of my head, but I'm surprised you didn't know this guy. 
you made a comment once at Traders Gallery, uh, Money Matters. And you see, it's really funny. These guys don't want to know each other. I did share that story with you where I introduced two key players. One of them was a billionaire. The other guy was pretty successful, and they didn't know each other, and I was the conduit. Right. Did they hit it off? I don't know. I can't keep track of that stuff. Come on, Larry. I'm in Saigon. I'm off the grid, man. You are the grid. <laughs> <laughs> Please, I'm my thing. <laughs> but if you ever come to what that is, because I'm fascinated. I can't tell you how fascinating. You ask why I was brought up in a family that they believed in work, hard work. Yeah, hard work to me always seems stupid. Small work, I really had appreciation for. The fact that so much is made by such simple shit in anything, it's like if you know. If you put your foot behind somebody else's, he's going down. A 120-pound girl could take down a 200-pound guy. If she hits him in the back of the leg, he'll go down because so he'll lose his balance. All right, listen, it was fun talking to you. I'm going to name this episode Simple Shit Works. <laughs> <laughs> but it does. Larry, I'll let you run. I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> all, right, all right, take it easy. Bye. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.